Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sean uh, Marcia. I'm going to be talking about saving the world with Ruby and Rails. And that's me on the Twitters, at Sean Marcia. And in case you're wondering, I'm an early adopter. That's how I was able to get my own name. Uh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> so I, I work at George Mason University as a software developer, and I'd like to thank them for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here and, uh, and do this kind of cool stuff. Uh, thank all of you, and thanks to my uh, Ruby group for letting me uh, practice this talk on them last week. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the history of the project, uh, then I'm going to talk about the technology we use, and then I'm going to hopefully tell you how you guys can all get involved. So, but really, I'm just going to tell you a story about bees. And my personal story uh, with bees began when I was about six years old. And for reference, that's me at six. Yeah, it's like an orange on a toothpick. But, but when I was six, my, my good friend and I, we were, we were out, we were wandering around, and we found a wild beehive. And if you know six-year-old boys, you can probably guess what we did next. You know, we started throwing rocks at it. And you know, my good friend, he just took off running, and I didn't know why, and it wasn't fun to throw rocks at the beehive without him. And it turns out that the bees stung him 20, 30 times, and uh, they didn't sting me. So I kind of feel I have this uh, karmic debt to the bees for leaving me alone. And so you know, let's jump forward to today. And uh, like I said, I'm a software developer at uh, George Mason University. And I was wandering across campus one day, and I saw this guy was giving a talk. This is uh, Her Herman Perea. And he was giving a talk about Amazonian stingerless bees and the honey they collect. And you know, as a, as a developer, I'm really in it for the swag. And since he was giving honey samples of these bees, that's why I went. And so I was listening to his talk. And actually, he told me what kind of animal that is. And I don't remember uh, right now, but I'll find out, because it's kind of something interesting. But so I was listening to his talk, and a after the talk, I went to, uh, to talk to Herman, and it turns out he's doing all this really interesting stuff about bees. And you know, bees are fascinating. If you don't know anything about them, like you know, there's 4,000 different varieties of bees in North America, if you guys uh, didn't know that. Um, they're re responsible for 90% of the wild, uh, wild plants, and uh, um, they're crazy hard workers. You know, one bee in its lifetime is going to gather one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey, and that's all it's going to do. But it's going to like visit fifty thousand flowers to do that. Um, Sixty to seventy percent of all our food uh, is because of bees, like from the pollination they do, or they pollinate the food that our food eats. Um, but the really crappy thing is the bees are dying and they're disappearing, and we don't know why. And this is actually starting to become big news, and people are starting to cover it. Just last fall, Time Magazine ran an article about you know, a world without bees and what the consequences are if we don't start doing something, and which directly leads to what Herman is doing. He's researching uh, this thing called colony collapse disorder. And if you're not familiar with colony collapse disorder, basically what it is is like uh, beehives and bee colonies will suddenly just collapse and disappear, and for no rhyme or reason. And it's, it's, a, it's serious. Uh, like for managed beehives, like that's beehives where there's like a beekeeper watching them, about 35% of them have just died out and vanished. Uh, for wild bees, it's much, much worse. Uh, in, in some areas of the country, 90% of the wild bees are just gone. Uh, like Virginia, where I'm from, it's about two thirds. Um, and it, like it's not just our problem either. Like it's happening in Europe. Like they're predicting in England by 2018, all the bees are gonna be gone. And that's, that's really serious. Um, uh, Asia, same, same situation. India, India it's particularly scary because in India, 90% of the pollination and honey comes from a wild bee that they can't domesticate. And as, like, as we know, it, it hits these wild bees harder. So if those bees get hit, you know, uh, India is going to be devastated. And so you know, some, of the, some of the theories about what's causing colony collapse disorder Maybe it's pesticides. Maybe it's these two variety of mites that the bees, for some reason, can't uh, can't clean from themselves. Could be disease, genetic factors. Like, like we just don't know. And it like, could be a combination of any of these. Um, like I've, I have one of my own theories up there that unfortunately isn't gaining any traction in the uh, beekeeping community. But I'll let you guys try and figure out which one it is. <laughs> and so, you know, hearing all this from Herman, it's like, hey, what can I do to help? And and you know, Herman didn't, doesn't have any technical skills. And, and so, but he told me, hey, I already have some beehives at George Mason. And it turns out they're up on top of a, a parking garage. Like, 
And so up five stories up, there, uh, you can see the top of another building nearby. And um, Herman said, you know, he would love in, uh, insight into, into these things, like the hive temperature, because uh, bees keep the temperature in the hive constant year-round. It doesn't matter if it's the middle of summer or middle of winter. And actually, just in the last, uh, last couple of years, they found out that you know, when they pull these, these combs out of the, uh, the beehive and there's the little holes in them, they always assume that the bees hadn't got around to filling them with honey. But what they've learned is there's a special drone bee that breaks its wings off and crawls into those holes and just vibrates all day long to uh, generate heat. I guess it's a life. Uh, <laughs> but, so, and he also wanted hive weight, you know, just sort of to see the uh, weight of the hive uh, changing over time. And then he wanted the outside humidity and temperature just kind of as, as control, because like, perhaps there'd be a week of really bad weather, and so like, that's why the weight wouldn't go up. They'd be, be eating their stores. And so I was like, OK. Uh, so again, looking at, at the situation, well, you know, the, immediately you know, we see there's some issues with this. You know, like it's open to the elements. We don't have any power. Our budget was really small. And we needed something that was really easy to repair and maintain because most of the people aren't very technical. And so the first thing we handled was the no power. Like this was the uh, low hanging fruit. And we did that simply by, by uh, uh, some solar panels, a deep cell battery, and uh, we had some off-grid power. And we found that our solar panels and battery could power our system for about seven to nine days uh, when there wasn't any sun. And so as long as we had sun at least once a week, we were, we were good to go. Um, so the next thing was we had a limited budget. And I, I think we started with less than $200 or about $200. And, and this is how things broke down and, and why you know, we used Raspberry Pis because we got the first three free, got a bunch of Raspberry Pi devices, uh, you know, some SD cards, cables. Like Who doesn't have a bunch of cables in their closet? Uh, and you see the solar set up there at $140. That was like the bulk of our initial costs. And you know, what I brought to the table was this MacGyver-like uh, ability to uh, figure out solutions to problems. And you know, like an, an, exa an example of that is um, when, we built our, when we put in our first temperature probe, we needed to uh, protect that probe somehow. And so which led me to, uh, you know, to quickly come up with a solution. I ran to uh, uh, student health services, asked them uh, if I could get some, some condoms from them to cover the, uh, the probe. And, and they didn't even flinch. They handed over a bunch of condoms. But it really made me realize that these, these people in campus health services have seen everything. Because when I walked in there, it was kind of dirty because I was outside working. And I was carrying uh, duct tape and rope. And, <laughs> and they didn't even flinch. They just handed over a handful of condoms. So, um, so like, th this wasn't perfect. Um, but we had a start. And I plugged in Twitter so we could get you know, social media going and some tweets from the Beehive. And, and so our, our initial results were... Uh, we had a tweeting beehive, a picture you can't really see, and it's tweeting, hey, it's 78 degrees in the hive, and a little picture of the, the bee yard, and, uh, and, and we're going. And, and one of the interesting things is once you're out on social media, um, people, I guess, they assume you know a lot about bees, and they start contacting you. And one of the first people to contact us, send us a direct message, is like, hey, how do I get my dog to stop eating bees? And so <laughs> we think eating the bees would probably be a, enough of a lesson, but... But, uh, you know, I, I, I Googled, and it turns out lots of dogs like to eat bees. And, you know, little dogs, medium-sized dogs, <laughs> and even big dogs. So, so before I go any further, who's, who's familiar with this acronym? Okay, some of the people here. This is something started by Brian Lyles uh, maybe five, six years ago. It means test all the... Fudging time? I always get stuck up on the F. But, uh, you know, no, no offense to Brian, but he's wrong. Really, what it should mean is try awesome things. Forget testing. Because if you, because if you forget testing, you can get results like this. It's currently 501 degrees in the hive. <laughs> and you'd think, oh, why is that valuable? Well, it turns out that people, uh, people find stuff like this amusing. And suddenly, and you can't read this, uh, but suddenly we're getting retweeted. Uh, the city of Fairfax is tweeting us, and people are asking us, are we raising fire bees? <laughs> is, is the hive on fire? Are, are things okay? And, uh, 
and, and it's, it's kind of amazing. Like all this, uh, all, all these tweeting and retweets and, and people getting in on the joke suddenly, uh, suddenly uh, was our own Gangnam style, uh, just making <laughs> make everyone aware of what we're doing. And it, it really made things happen fast, and it brought us into the attention of uh, the Sweet Virginia Foundation. And what they are is they're a nonprofit that uh, teaches honey, honeybee education to, to students and, and adults. And, and they wanted to help. They didn't know we were raising, raising bees at George Mason. And so they, uh, they, they said, well, what can we do? We can offer you space. Uh, and Herman wanted to, uh, to, to have a class of researchers. And uh, we didn't have the equipment, but we had the space, which was you know, one of the biggest uh, issues. And so, uh, so what we did is we started a crowdfunding campaign uh, because it was going to be about $1,000 per student. And we, we raised $12,000, which, which was amazing, so we could have a class of 12. Uh, and it, actually, there was a waiting list of over 100 students trying to you know, take part in this research. But, so we had 12. And then this, this Kickstarter campaign, or sorry, uh, Indiegogo campaign, uh, also was like another big social media uh, raising awareness for us. And so suddenly, so suddenly again, you know, people are becoming aware and... Bees have just become crazy popular at at George Mason University, and so the uh, the one of the fraternities is starting a Bee Global campaign. Uh, the uh, magazine, the alumni magazine, is all about bees, and this is the president of George Mason with uh, Herman there, and uh, and the really amazing thing about uh, you know the president getting involved is you know suddenly we uh, we have a budget. Um, <laughs> And so now, now, which leads us into the technology and uh, the interesting stuff. Um, so for anyone working with Raspberry Pi or is unfamiliar with the Raspberry Pi, uh, that's what this is. It's a credit card-sized computer. It, like, this is an entire computer. And so I invite you to come up after and look, with, look at it and play with it. And if you want to come uh, uh, later in one of the evenings, I'm probably going to be hacking on it and playing with it. So I invite you to uh, seek me out later. Um, but if you're going to work with Raspberry Pis, some advice I'd give you is to, is to back up your card often, like take an image of it, and don't, don't go the traditional DevOps route where you're going to you know, install everything on there. Because if you ever had to wait for like Nokaguri to compile on your computer, uh, Nokaguri compiling, compiling on a Raspberry Pi is about 60 times as long. So it's better just to have an image and then you know, copy that image. And, and buy a couple because they're cheap. They're $30 computers that are full computers. Um, so Raspberry Pis have these GPIO pins on them, which is general purpose input output, and it's the same kind of thing you have uh, if you've ever opened up a desktop computer and look, looked at how your hard drive plugs into the, the motherboard. It's the same kind of thing, and there's these pins, and for reference, this is with one of the sensors plugged into one of my Pis. Um, you plug it in, and you may see some tutorials online if you're going to do some of the stuff that says that says uh, uh, solder the, the wires right to your Pi. Uh, don't do that, because if, if your Pi breaks or you don't know, uh, it's easy just to you know, swap it out, take a Pi, throw it away, and plug it into the new one. Or I guess maybe not throw it away, because it might not be broke. And so if you are going to be uh, working with Pis, these are the uh, three gems I'd recommend checking out. There's the GPIO gem, you know, uh, Pi Piper and Wiring Pi Ruby. Uh, you know, I'm not going to suggest which is best out of the three, because they're all amazing. And it's, I guess it's my own Sophie's choice. Um, but so as to saving the world with Ruby and Rails, I lied. Uh, I'm actually using Ruby and Sinatra. So I guess if you want to get up and leave now, feel free. Uh, um, so I, I went with the, uh, the dashing gem. I originally I was using, a, uh, for creating a dashboard, I was using the dashing Rails. But I, I realize I don't need all the, uh, the complexity that, that Rails brings to the table, especially because we wanted a solution that was as simple for other beekeepers elsewhere to look at and to use. And you know, we don't want to have to explain the controllers and, and spitting out JSON and all this kind of, all this kind of stuff that they just they don't need. And so, and so using, working with da dashing is as simple as you know, gem install dashing and then dashing new, uh, much like using Rails. And if you are interested in more about dashing, I suggest going to Ruby Nation, where Carl, Durante, and Chris Marr are giving a talk on it, because their talk is phenomenal. Um, but after doing this, you have a dashboard that we can't see too well. But you can see there's, uh, we're using the green and the gold, because that's George Mason's colors. But we have our in in internal temperature, uh, external temperature, internal humidity, and outside humidity. 
And if the numbers seem low uh, for the temperature, that's because we're using Celsius. Um, we're, I guess, because we're not all in the uh, imperial system. And that's the weight in kilograms. And, and what this is, is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's being wirelessly served. So you walk up to the, ra the, the, the beehive, open up your laptop, uh, connect to the beehive, and then navigate to beehive.local, and then this pops up, and you can see the uh, current statistics in the hive. And how did we do this? And we did this uh, simply with a, a series of cron jobs. And if you're unfamiliar with how cron works, uh, the first one is running at 0 and 12 hours, so midnight and noon. Second one's running at midnight, 6 a.m., noon, 6 p.m., and, and so forth. And, and, and that's it. Like three, th three simple uh, scripts and is gathering all our information. And this is an example of one of our scripts. So making a little... little uh, uh, an instance of our sensor uh, defining a couple of uh, directories. And if you see, uh, directories are in the public, uh, the public folder. And, and the reason, again, is just to sort of keep it simple. If one of the researchers wants to, to get access to the CSV file, when they're logged on to beehive.local, they just type in inhumid.csv and it downloads to their computer or their tablet or whatever they're using. And it's as simple as just writing the uh, humidity and the temperature into two different... Uh, CSV files, and that's it. And same thing for the outside. Uh, and so you're probably thinking, well, it's hard to get it up on the dashboard. And, but it's not. Dashing makes this simple. Uh, every 1,000 seconds, I, I'm opening up the, uh, the, the CSV file and then sending it to the, uh, the dashboard. And it's as simple as that. It's, you know, uh, nothing too complicated. And this is the, the Python code, but I'm not going to explain. It was... It came with the, the scale, so I didn't bother re, uh, redoing it in Ruby. But now that our scale's having issues, I'm going to uh, uh, work on a new solution with a Ruby gem. And the other thing we used is we used Passenger, just as for our server. Uh, we used a couple of Linux packages for our, basically creating our wireless access point um, and the uh, wireless and DHCP server. And that was it. And this is simple. And I think it's so simple that Anyone here can do it. Anyone who's do, been doing Ruby and Rails for le at least a week, maybe two, uh, like there's nothing to it. And I want you all here to go out and do stuff like this. Um, because I think we're all amazing. And we, we, sometimes, uh, we sometimes get this sense in our head that, you know, oh, we, we have all these problems and we're, we're living in this kind of ivory tower that isn't really representative of, you know, the rest of, uh, the, rest of the country. Uh, like, we're kind of the Silicon Valley mindset. It's, oh, i got to get my queuing speed down from 0.6 milliseconds to 0.58 milliseconds, or I have, to, uh, I have to get my tests to run faster. That make DHH happy. Uh, or, you know, we, we have all these, these issues, but, you know, the vast majority of, uh, of people, like, I work in a, in a university, and I see every day people emailing spreadsheets back and forth. They email text files back and forth, and like all these solutions that are just horrible and and really educators they need our help and they need us to get involved in projects like this and it's super easy to get involved in these kind of things like I, I'm involved in three projects right now and all of them I got involved with just by going to see a professor talk and then after his talk I or her talk you know I asked I just asked them questions because you know professors Professors have bigger egos than we do as, as, as developers. They love to talk about themselves. They do. And they love to talk about their research, like even more than we love to talk about our code. And so I know, I know you're thinking, Sean, you, you dirty Canadian socialist. You know, like, w w why, why should I do this? You know, I don't want to give my, my time for free. And I guess, like, the, the simplest reason is, is, like, I run a Ruby meetup group. And one of the first questions I'm... I'm generally asked by new people is, you know, how can I get involved in open source? Like, because like, open source seems like this, this goal that you want, but you just don't know how to get to if you're new. And, and you know, doing project that, like, projects like this it really is, a, is an easy gateway into open source and to, and to uh, you know, getting... Uh, open source credentials on your, on your resume and on your GitHub. Because, you know, like it or not, 
when we do apply for jobs, they do look at what we, we do in the open source community. And can't really uh, see this, but this, this is one of the, uh, the extra benefits of, of doing a project like this is, uh, is all the puns. And it's like, you know, I, you can't really see these, but I gave this talk last week, and every one of these are, are B puns, like, hey, buzz off, pal. Uh, you know, Sean has a tendency to wax on, and what's the buzz about? And ooh, it's going to be sweet. It's the bee's knees. And so, so if this is the kind of thing that interests you and, and you might want to go out and get involved in, I'd really like you to check out uh, Ruby for Good. And it's a conference we're going to be putting on in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, the first to third to August. Uh, we're going to be staying in the dorms at George Mason University. We're going to hack on open source, social good projects. Um, it's going to be 72 people. Um, we're aiming for $200 or less, and that's all inclusive of your lodging, your food, everything. You just have to get there. Uh, you're welcome to come a day early uh, for no extra cost, and we're going to probably do something fun the, uh, uh, the day before, maybe go do a nighttime tour of the DC monuments or something, not quite sure. And, uh, and also, maybe to make it more appealing for your work, we're going to hold, we're going to have some training sessions on the second day. Uh, we have one of the guys from the RSpec core team coming out, uh, going to give a, a workshop on RSpec. Uh, we have a guy giving a workshop on Angular, and another uh, one of the JSON API committers doing a workshop on creating APIs. And that's my talk in a nutshell. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and are there any questions? <laughs>